Welcome to St. John's United Church of Christ in Vincennes, Indiana. Whether you're here in Sanctuary or at home on Facebook Live, remember that whoever you are and wherever you are in life's journey, you're welcome here. It's good to see everybody. Uh, if you're here in Sanctuary, please fill out the pew pads and send them back to the center. If you're at home, uh, please uh, click the like button or make a comment so we may know of your presence with us this morning. Uh, Life of the church, Monday is New Year's Day, so church office is closed. Uh, Wednesday, we're going to be at 5 p.m., we're going to be eating at McAllister's. So there is a sign-up sheet if you think you might like to come. Uh, Wednesday is also choir, and Friday is Phoebe's mission. Um, uh, evangelism and membership are looking for folks who would be willing to be greeters. Uh, so there is information in your, in your announcement sheet about that, and there's also a sign-up sheet and information on the bulletin board outside the uh, church office. Next Sunday, after worship, there will be a de-decorating event. I, I thought that sounded a little, yeah, de-decorating. So uh, please, if you'd like to help stay for a while and uh, help us get things gathered and taken down, that would be most wonderful. We ask for prayers for the family and friends of Joy Tooley. Uh, she died December 27th and her funeral was yesterday. Uh, and she was buried on what was the fifth anniversary of her husband Bruce's funeral and burial. So. Um, Continue prayers for the family of Danny Roark uh, on his uh, death, of course, and uh, uh, please continue to pray for those who are on our prayer list, as well as those who are homebound and living in health care facilities and assisted living facilities. Are there other announcements or concerns we need to make? If not, I invite all who are able to please rise and greet each other in the name of the Lord. God from the depths. Praise God in all circumstances. Praise the Creator from the depths. Praise God who shapes us. Let all praise the name of the Holy One. The glory of God reigns in heaven and on earth. Praise the Holy One.
menace and valleys, on storming seas, and on mountaintops. We welcome your presence now as we come to worship you. We gather in gratitude and assurance that you are our God, and we proclaim with gladness that we are your people. Some come in need of encouragement or comfort. Others need a healing touch. We hunger and thirst for righteousness as we praise and honor your name. Transform us to be living vessels of your love and living witnesses of your continuing presence in the world. Amen.
Thank you. Please come forward. Come sit up here. Give me five. All right. All right. Good morning. How are you, young man? I like your hat. Did you get that for Christmas? No? No. Did you get presents for Christmas? Yeah. You have a favorite one? I'm sorry, what? Drum set. Yeah, drum set. Whoa. Now you got to practice and we'll get you to play. Okay? That's pretty cool. Pastor Linda wants to come play. Can she play your drum set? <laughs> so, who gave you that drum set? Santa Claus? Okay, cool. So you got a snare drum, bass drum, you got drums. Yeah, all right, great. You like to play? Cool. Well, getting presents is pretty cool at Christmas time, isn't it? Yeah. And people get all sorts of different kinds of presents. Uh, and uh, sometimes they're toys and sometimes they're instruments. Huh? Did you get some clothes, maybe? No, yeah. Not real excited about the clothes, huh? Oh, okay, sorry. That's cool. The thing is about Christmas presents is that, well... Sometimes we get a favorite toy, but then we either outgrow it or it breaks, you know. And if we get clothes, that's okay, but then we get bigger, right? And then we don't get to fit in them anymore. And, and so presents don't always last very long. But it's important for us to remember that there is a gift that we get at Christmas and get all the time doesn't wear out we don't outgrow it and do you know what gift that might be we get at Christmas uh, it's a little baby is in a manger over there it's baby Jesus because Jesus is God's way of showing us the love that God has for us each and every day and Jesus and Jesus shows us that God will loves us and will protect us and take care of us and give us everything that we need. And so it's a gift that we have all the time. It is, can you do this? You make one of these? You make a heart? Can you do that? Yeah. It's the love of God given to us through Jesus. And so I want you to remember that each and every day, even when you might even feel lonely sometimes, that you're not alone because God is with us and that God loves us so much that God sent a son that we might live forever. Okay? Will you pray with me, please? You can hold your hand. Dear God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, the gift that keeps giving all the time, the gift that never grows old, the gift that we never outgrow. It is a gift that we thank you for. And we ask that not only those of us who are here, not only Grady and the other children, that, that everyone may know of the gift of your son Jesus and the hope and the love that comes with that. Thank you, God. We ask these prayers in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, you can go back to your seat.
we rejoice in their presence. We are thankful in these moments for all the gifts God has given, for this good earth, for calling us to be partners in the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ, and that through this congregation, we might know the blessing of working with others to carry out and fulfill that ministry. Will those who are able please rise as we praise God as the offering is brought forward. scripture. I will rejoice, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. And in Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, we hear these words. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. And this lesson that comes to us from the Gospel of Luke. When the time had come for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dim dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for your glory, and for glory to your people Israel. 
And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer day and night. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. May our God bless the reading and the hearing of these words. Amen. On a Sunday that happened to be December 26, the pastor tells the story. There's a cartoon in the New Yorker magazine. It says it all. He says, in the middle of the floor is a dried up, 
withered Christmas tree. Picture this now. The calendar on the wall reads December 26th. Dad is sitting in his chair with an ice bag on his head. Home, Mom is in a bathrobe and her hair is in rollers. The floor is a virtual mountain of torn wrappings and boxes and bows and Junior's reaching into the stocking to be sure that there's no more candy. And in the background, we see a table with th a thoroughly picked turkey still sitting there. And the caption of the cartoon reads simply this, the morning after. Well, perhaps this is a little bit of the way that you might have felt the morning after. Perhaps we uh, seem some, feel somewhat let down. Perhaps we feel somewhat not only let down, but if we feel that way, it's quite understandable. Because you see, over the past weeks, our emotions have been wound tighter than a toy doll. Uh, our festivities have led up to a near fever pitch, and then suddenly it's all over. If it any wonder that it's somewhat a letdown, Psychiatrists even have a word for it. It's called the Christmas slump. Well, is it possible to lose the spirit of Christmas that quickly? Now, let us be candid that as we take down the decorations for another year, there is that sinking emptiness and an emotional letdown. Now, this pastor continues and said, my mom gave up on living real Christmas trees and went to artificial. But I remember when I grew up, there were, we did all those things, you know, to keep the tree green, put aspirin in there. Now, I never really did that, but that's what this guy said. You put aspirin in there, and you put, or you put uh, sugar, right? You try to keep the tree to, to keep the needles falling off. But you know, it never seemed to work. Let's be candid about this. Why? Why is it that we feel so drug out? Why is it that we feel so withered like the tree? Just maybe it's because like the tree, we've been cut off from the roots. Now, how is that for you? After the craziness of Christmas, the preparations, have you found time to, to really let down? Wondering what just happened? Did you have the moment of falling into your recliner or on that couch and a sigh of exhaustion and the limpness of frailty, of, fin of finality? Now imagine what Mary and Joseph have been through. More than nine months prior to this, this morning's scripture lesson, God comes to Mary and says, Mary, you're pregnant. Yeah, I know you're a teenager, Mary, but you're pregnant, and you're pregnant with the Son of God. Wow. This young married couple now, Mary and Joseph, are being thrust into parenthood. They, they are poor, simple people who are being given the responsibility of bringing God's Son into the world, the Messiah into the world. And they are told to, and then they're told to report to Bethlehem for a census. So they have to leave Nazareth, travel all the way to Bethlehem. And when they get there, there's no place for them to stay, and so they end up in a stable, and the baby Jesus is born in a stable with the animals. And, of course, you know the rest of the story, right? Ah, but there's more. You see, after the birth and everything that happened and all that, and the shepherds came and, and that kind of thing, they still had some obligations, for they are religious people. And so they know that they're now supposed to take Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. So now, from Nazareth to Bethlehem, over to Jerusalem. 
And so they go to the temple that they, that they may be cleansed. You know? and, and, you know, it, 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 if you think about it, why does this really have to happen? I mean, all this traveling and everything they have to do, and so now they come to Jerusalem, they come to the temple to be purified. They meet Simeon, a wise and older elder, and then they meet Anna, an older and wiser seer, and then they return home to Nazareth. Holy guacamole. By the way, that's a theological term. Don't you think that Mary and Joseph would be worn out. I don't think that Mary and Joseph would be stressed out and overwhelmed. Might they be a little scared of what is about that uh, was out there before them? Might they have that morning after feeling? Yeah, maybe. Now, I want to go back to this morning's gospel lesson and dig a little deeper into the experience in the temple. Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem because they know that is what they're supposed to do. And they are faith, faithful believers and know that the law tells them to do and to go and be purified. And they go and they meet Simeon. Now, Simeon is not a priest or a scribe, but he is a faithful and devout follower of God. And he has been told by God that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah. Now, Simeon's encounter with God was not just a few weeks ago, but rather decades ago. And so he's been waiting and anticipating and watching and looking for the coming of the Messiah. And now it happens. Simeon, in an encounter with God, assured him that when he saw the Messiah, then he would be able to die. He would die. So now Simeon can die in peace. But wait a minute. Purification? What's that about? This is Jesus, the Son of God. This is Mary, the mother of Jesus. There is no need for either of them to be purified. Karl Barth writes this. When Jesus was baptized, he needed to be washed of sin. Not his sin, though, but our sin. No one who came to the Jordan was laden and afflicted as he, so no one ever came to the temple for purification as laden with sin, not his or his mother's, but ours. That was the burden of Jesus. I want to take a moment to look at the vessel in which the Messiah comes to us. God's people waited centuries for the coming of the Messiah. For many of them, the expectations was a great savior riding in on a great war horse and free the people of the oppression of whoever happened to be ruling Israel at the time. And yes, Jesus the Messiah comes into the world, but as a baby. James Howell writes this in an article in Feasting in the Word. He writes, but Jesus was just a baby, and this is God's shrewdest device. As Luther put it, God became small for us in Christ. He showed us his heart so our hearts might be won. Infants, you know, wield a kind of power. Think about it. Muscular men with calloused hands become gentle as pillows when they're handed a baby. Potent people with gruff voices adopt a falsetto and coo to an infant. We were never taught baby talk as adults. Put a baby in front of us, right? God came down not to thrash evildoers or crush the Romans, but rather as an infant to elicit love, to nurture tenderness. 
And after the encounter with Simeon and Anna, Mary and Joseph return home to Nazareth. But there's more. Together, they raise Jesus, and he grows to be a man. Jesus is called to minister to God's people. He preaches and teaches. He heals and eventually gives his life. And where does he do all this? Is it amongst the rich and the powerful and the famous? No. It's amongst the poor, the outcast, and the marginalized. And those are Jesus' people. Mary and Joseph are very young and very poor. Shelley Copeland writes this. She says, The text tells us that Mary and Joseph, who Matthew says later blessed were with gifts from kings, could not even afford the lamb that was given for the sacrifice at the time of the purification in the temple. They presented the gift assigned to the poor, a pair of turtle doves. Over and again, people told them of the blessing they had in their arms, and every day they struggled to make ends meet. Shelley Copeland goes on to write, we live in a society where it is hard to understand the blessings of poverty. Mary and Joseph, like many poor parents in, the midst, in our midst today, were trying to be faithful by the journey, but the journey was not easy. In the context of that capitalism of our generation, it is hard to accept the idea of being blessed, but not prosperous. They are blessed. The challenge for us is to wrestle with the injustice that many poor people face today. While they are blessed, they hold new life and future possibilities in their arms. They possess faith, and yet they must find a way to afford the social expectations, even of church life, let alone the rest of society. For many, the poor of the poor, but faithful in our time, this is still a painful reality. Remember that scene the morning after that I started with, exhausted by the crazy busyness of preparation, shopping and overextension, laid limp on the couch with, with, from the burst of high energy and high expectations of the secular side of Christmas, and as we recover from all of that, I want us to hear these final words from Shelley Copeland. As a people of faith in a privileged nation, we have an obligation to care for the poor families in tangible ways so they can raise their children with limited burdens. We miss out as a community when we do not acknowledge that all children in our midst are a gift to the world. Perhaps we are called to create a society with a positive regard for struggling faithful parents because we believe we are co-stewards of the future. Perhaps this text is pleading with those of us in this generation to create a more just society for the children who come into the world through parents of limited means, or maybe in the midst of war, or in the midst of famine, or in the midst of disease. We have questions with which we, we are to grapple. If Jesus were born today to teen parents in American urban poverty, would, we, would he be better off now than he was 2,000 years ago? And will we answer the call to create a global community that makes sure all mothers and fathers have adequate health care, food, education, clothing, and shelter? When we consider the abundance of our nation, 
Do faithful people of means have an obligation to the poor beyond offering them verbal blessings? How do we answer those questions? Well, I pray. I pray that your Christmas was merry one and that your ministry will be a mighty one. Amen. Together, we lift our prayers to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy God, our help in ages past, we give you thanks for the gift and marvel of creation far beyond our comprehension. For creating humankind in your own image and for making us co-creators with you. For being with us all the days of our lives, even though at times we may not be aware of your presence, or we may turn from you, or we wonder where you are in the midst of the struggles of life. We give you thanks for this last year. Envelop us in your peace for the losses we have experienced. And forgive us for the failures we have known. Ever present one, we give you thanks for surrounding us with your presence in these moments. For calling us into the body of Christ where we know the support of others and can give support to others, whether here in this local congregation or with and for sisters and brothers throughout the world who give witness to your way of life and love. <clears throat> Eternal and everlasting one, be our hope for years to come. For this coming year and for all of its days and moments, guide us with your presence. Fulfill hope for peace in the world, peace with justice, especially for those who are in war-torn places, those who are in need of food and shelter, of friendship, of clean water, of the necessities of life, which we so often take for granted. Guide us as your church, that we may witness in the world, both in word and in deed, to the way of life to which you call us, that we might witness to your love, to your mercy, to your grace, to your justice, and to the hope you place in our hearts. For we pray in the name of the Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Go forth now as God's holy and beloved people. Go forth and may you know the blessings that God gives to us. Hope for all the tomorrows of life. Peace that passes all human understanding. Joy knowing that you are held in the embrace of God and love that comes from God's heart, God's very own heart. And you may, may you share that love with all people everywhere. Go forth now in the name of the Christ, in the name of the Creator, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.